Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of R-Rated, where today we're looking at the third episode of She-Hulk, The People vs. Emil Blonsky. Uh, I think, if I had to guess, so I when, when this show was first airing, I knew that I wasn't keeping up with it as the episodes were coming out, so I tried to kind of stay away from any social media stuff about any of these episodes because like all right i don't want i don't want to be spoiled on things i don't want you know random stuff to kind of uh you know taint my first viewing of it when i do get around to it and i definitely noticed that there was a point fairly early on where the tide was turning a little bit uh kind of against the show and i would have to imagine this episode is probably uh the starting point for that um it's complicated. I guess it's not that complicated. It's actually a pretty straightforward reason why, uh, uh, you know, folks might start feeling less great about the show. Um, my thoughts on it are a little bit more complicated perhaps, but, uh, this is, this is the Wong episode, uh, which is ironic considering, uh, Jennifer states directly to the camera to to not expect this to be a cameo a week show, even though it has been so far between uh, Bruce and Emil and Wong. Uh, and there's others that will be coming down the line, at least one that I know of. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I know of any others, but regardless, um, the 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 commentary that's on moth the commentary on that is honestly I, I do appreciate the fourth wall breaking they do some the you know it's not obnoxious how often it happens like she has a fourth wall awareness but she's not quite as uh constant i don't even know if constant is the right word but like so if you think deadpool deadpool is like constantly quipping and constantly you know, making jokes and stuff that's like, it's not so much necessarily fourth wall breaking, but it's, I mean, it is, but it's not specifically that it's more meta, you know, humor specifically. Whereas Jennifer is basically having a conversation with the audience. Um, for Deadpool, he's got this, you know, internal monologue that also involves the fourth wall. I want to say he, depending on when you're reading him, has either two or three separate voices essentially in his head. He's got his own voice. He's got the comic book narrator, essentially the the yellow box. Uh, I could swear that there's like one more uh, that shows up. It might literally be whenever you get text that's not in a yellow box. That's another separate voice that Deadpool can interact with. Uh, but there's points there's points in this episode where she talks directly to the camera and it's fine. Uh, near the end of the episode when the two subplots kind of meet together, she, she calls that out and says, Ooh, a, a and B points, uh, a and B plots, uh, converging. Nice. That's like, all right, it's kind of fun. Um, and early in the episode when she's trying to figure out who Wong is, uh, you know, she talks directly to the audience in a car while she was driving, but then she just kind of like turns away from the wheel because it's her existing outside of the scope of her own, uh, you know, the, the world that she's in to have that conversation. Um, I didn't mention either. Uh, so in the first episode, when Jennifer talks to the audience, so Bruce is like, you know, if you want to leave, you can. And she turns to the, she turns to the camera and is like, he doesn't mean that. And then two things happen. One, Bruce looks back at her kind of like a what? And at the same time, she looks to the camera like, wait, what? Like she doesn't understand what's going on either. But Bruce hears her say that in the second episode, when, uh, when Jennifer starts, you know, when Jennifer finds out essentially that she is only wanted at GLK and H because she is She-Hulk and she's to be She-Hulk when she's working, uh, she has another, you know, to the audience sort of rant that goes on there. And that one is not heard by anyone. In fact, uh, her, her boss, Mr. Holloway, is still talking the entire time that she's having this moment and then asks her her opinion, uh, asks, yeah, asks for her opinion on what he just said. And she, she does an okay job of kind of getting herself out of it. I'm curious what the actual line was that was written for him to speak, even if it wasn't necessarily the in-universe thing that was being referred to. But the point being, it seems like, you know, as she's gotten more used to those powers, she is, uh, she's able to communicate more freely outside the scope of her own universe, you could say. Um, so it was just interesting to see the the differences there. Uh, 
I'm trying to save certain things for later on here. Um, we have, I guess I'll get into the B plot. The B plot for this episode, because there are two very distinct plots for this. The B plot involves uh, Jennifer's new associate, uh, Pug, Mr. Pugliese, uh, working with, essentially taking on Dennis from the DA's office as a client because he was defrauded out of, I think it was like $175,000. Uh, essentially, he thought that he was dating Megan the Stallion. Uh, and it turned out that she was actually a shape-shifting light elf from New Asgard. Her father is, I guess, a, uh, a diplomat. Um, I don't know if it's like an ambassador or what, but she is this, she's basically just this chaos elemental for the whole episode. She keeps copying other people's forms and making them do and say things that they wouldn't normally do. Um, it was kind of a fun little chaotic thing. And knowing that they're not, or assuming, I guess I could be wrong, assuming that they're not just putting that subplot in there for nothing. Like they do resolve it using Jennifer later, but I would not be surprised at all if, this light elf's shape shifting powers actually matter by the end of the show for something like if she comes back for a thing, you know, some public appearance or or whatever. Um, but we'll see, we'll see there. Uh, she refers at one point to so uh, um, she oh what is the what is the oh the the her her attorney her defense attorney uh, the light elf. So her attorney essentially says like, oh, well, her father is a diplomat in New Asgard. She has diplomatic immunity. The judge says that like, oh, well, that's New Asgard, not here. She doesn't have diplomatic immunity here. And then uh, Runa, I think, is the name of the light elf. Runa stands up and says, but, but your honor, Asgard is not a place. It's a people. And it's like a fun little, a fun little ref, uh, like reference back to uh, the line from Thor Ragnarok. Though the judge does slam it down pretty quickly, being, uh, saying Thor's inspirational speeches do not, do not uh, are not admissible in court. And it's like okay, that was that was cute. Oh, that was a little fun thing there. the The show has been very, uh, very light, uh, very light hearted, very light in general. Um, it may actually be. It may be the most overtly comedic one that we've had in total. I'm trying to think of the other shows. Loki, Miss Marvel, What If, uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, uh, WandaVision. I Am Groot, I guess, is obviously very co very co comedic. I was going to say comical or c comedy. It's very comedy. Um, but yeah, no, I think this might be the most straight-up comedy that we're getting uh, in phase four. Am I forgetting one? I'm probably forgetting one. Uh, Moon Knight. Oh, yeah. Moon Knight was definitely not, you know, it had comedic beats. All of them do. But uh, this one seems to be the most like light fare, generally speaking, at least so far. So I think that's fine. I'm fine with with kind of silly humor stuff in there, especially if that's like the main focus for a bunch of this. Um, it does give characters a sense of being a little stupid at times, uh, Pug comes off as being sort of w occasionally kind of brainless or um, naive, I guess, even though he's an attorney at a like really well-respected law firm. So that's kind of it. And it's the juxtaposition there. But it's also, you know, it is a comic book series, right? Like, it's fine if, if it's more of a silly thing. The A plot of this episode deals with Jennifer taking on Emil Blonsky as her client and dealing with the parole board. So essentially, he is up for parole for the first time since uh, the attack on Harlem, which I guess got him 15 years in prison, basically. Um, and, you know, they, they kind of went over the, the establishment of this sort of setup in the last episode and she goes to speak with Emil and he explains like, oh, yeah, I was taken out of here of, uh, you know, against my will, but I chose to come back. Uh, eventually, Wong shows up and says the same thing and was like, look, I'm trying to train to be Sor Sorcerer Supreme. And that means I need opponents. I took him against his will, but I also offered him asylum if he wanted it. And he told me, no, he wanted to come back. And it's like, oh, OK, like I'm, I am really digging the characterization they're going with for Emil where 
in the Incredible Hulk, he seemed like this relentless, cannot, uh, uh, cannot allow himself to lose guy. Just this uh, uh, totally laser focused individual uh, who you know would kill you know anyone to get to get to the you know to get to the Hulk. And like that's still sort of true, but essentially, you know, Emil Blonsky is sort of like I thought I was the good guy. I have been trying to atone for the things that I've done. I just want to live on a farm quietly, work and live out my days with with my seven soulmates who we actually see in this episode. Uh, it's definitely like a borderline Manson kind of, uh, you know, little mini cult sort of thing going on there. But uh, he seems genuinely um, he seems genuinely to, you know, feel sorry for the things that he did. He can freely and controllably change between uh, himself and the abomination basically on the level that, that, uh, Bruce could circa the Avengers, right? Cause after the Avengers, uh, he, you know, seemed to kind of have trouble getting from one to the other. He wasn't in, you know, much of a like harmony with his Hulk personality. And it eventually took merging the two, uh, by the time of end game for him to have any sort of stability there. Um, Though granted, considering Jennifer can also freely transform between her two states and doesn't have a second personality and it doesn't seem like Emil does either, it seems like that's a very specifically Bruce thing. Like Bruce may have just DID and the transformation into the Hulk sort of just brought that out from under the surface. Uh, it's kind of hard to tell, you know, whether whether that's something that's always been there and has been exacerbated by this or if it's, you know, a specific just him effect thing in some in the same way that for miss marvel the bengal wasn't the source of her power but it also did stuff itself it does seem like there's the possibility that bruce's transformation into the hulk is one thing but his two personalities fighting each other are another or the same thing as uh for wolverine how his healing factor and his bone claws are a ge are a genuine mutation uh, but the adamantium skeleton was done artificially later. They're not the same power. They are two separate things that just happen to be going on in the same person. Um, so I don't know. I, 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 I thought that the parole setup was generally handled really well. I thought that they did a good job of adding some, some, uh, little, not twists exactly, but stressors. There's like little things going wrong, but Jennifer holds her own really well, is able to get through it all. Wong shows up and then disappears uh, shortly after when they say that him taking a federal prisoner out of Supermax uh, constitutes a crime. And he's just like, well, I'm out of here. Bye. Uh, I thought that was fun. Emil in full control of his transformation. Um, I'm curious if he'll show up again or if this is kind of him giving some closure to that character. Um you know, if he doesn't show up again in this season, he could certainly show up in one of the other major events like, you know, Secret Wars. Granted, conditions of his release meant that he can't transform. He's going to wear an inhibitor, which I assume is a banner invention because I don't know who the hell else is going to be making transformation inhibitors. I don't know. Um, and, yeah, if he, if he violates that, then he goes back to prison, which... Um, Obviously, I feel like during extenuating circumstances could change, you know, but we'll see. Uh, the, uh, the the main kind of theme that's kind of running through this episode, we've got more of the um, we got more of the theme of uh, how to how to really describe this, I guess, sexism and um, the accusation of derivative -ness, derivation. Uh, there's a point where we see a montage of social media reactions about She-Hulk and someone who, uh, legitimately, I, li I wrote down in my, in my notes, oh, look, Jeremy Hambly's here. Um, cause they cast someone who looks not unlike, uh, him. I'm not going to say his channel's name, uh, to, to, Oh God, what was his line? Oh yeah. So they took the Hulk's manhood away and they gave it to a woman. And it's like, I know that it's way on the nose dialogue for this show. I get that. But 
I would be more annoyed with it if it wasn't very just straight up literally what folks have have said online. Like I've watched people make just about these exact arguments and it's if it feels pathetic and straw manny to see it in the show, just know that it's accurate unfortunately to some of the actual discourse going on online uh which is dumb and embarrassing and stupid uh it would be one thing to like tackle it from the perspective of when she hulk was created as a character i don't know when that would have been my best guess would be like the 70s i'm just gonna guess 1973 i have no idea uh maybe it's more modern i really don't know but Going after that, criticizing that as the character's origin and her name, especially, and her power set and those, that I get. Then making a She-Hulk show, which is not a spinoff of the movie The Incredible Hulk, it's a TV adaptation of the She-Hulk character from the comics, it's a very different thing. I feel like it's silly to be like, well, they got a She-Hulk now? And it's like they've had a She-Hulk for decades. They've had a Red Hulk and a Red She-Hulk too. And, a, and I guess Gray Hulk is kind of complicated. Uh, but like they've had these characters for a long ass time. Uh, it's it's very, very sad and stupid to, to make arguments about like, Oh, it's it's just they're just giving they're just giving the MCU and all that. Sh it's so stupid. I don't want to get into it. It's such a huge distraction from all of this. But this episode kind of gets into that a bit at the beginning there. Um, I'm sure to some degree that was a quick bit of catharsis for some of the folks working on the show too. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I don't mind that that one's super on the nose just because it is accurate. Unfortunately. Um, the part that's less uh the part that's less good in this episode and probably the one it stands out the most to me as being the most needless and negative here and if you've seen the episode yourself you already know what I'm going to get at but um so we're told early in the episode that Runa the light elf uh tricked Dennis by shapeshifting into the form of Megan the Stallion uh, that's fine. I think that's kind of a fun, silly ass thing to have in there. They have a quick video of her on YouTube transforming back, uh, and, and just giggling and having fun and all of that. And from the character of Dennis, it's, it's a legitimately funny thing for this extremely, uh, conceited guy to be like, oh yeah, I could pull, I could pull Megan the Stallion. Yeah, totally. Uh, Granted, when we first see him in the episode, he pretty much like in the in the bluntest way conceivable sexually harasses uh, another associate of Jennifer's in the superhuman law division. She shows up for the first time in the show, walks into the room and Dennis basically just objectifies her in front of everybody in front of Jennifer and Pug and Mr. Holloway, all of whom are like. Okay, all right, Ugh. and and she just leaves. Uh, yeah, so that's that's not great. Um, so my problem with the Megan the Stallion stuff is it probably should have just ended with the YouTube video and just the references in general uh, about the fact that she shapeshifted there. Instead, when the verdict is handed down. Megan the Stallion is in the courtroom in the viewing gallery and has a line about like, oh, that's right. There's only one Megan the Stallion. And it's like, what? what? That's so blunt. <laughs> and it, like, it feels so added in at the last possible second. And then, of course, there's the stinger at the end of the episode where... I don't even remember. I don't even remember the circumstances of it. Uh, she had to come. To, uh, Jennifer came to work to get some signatures from Megan the Stallion, probably either for like a harassment thing or a an impersonation, something restraining order. Who knows? Uh, and then there's some music playing, and Mister Holloway is going to see Jennifer about something, and we get 
and we go in and Jennifer and Megan the Stallion are kind of just bumping and grinding and twerking and such. And there, like there was a point a few seconds in where it was like, oh, okay, they're just kind of goofing around, having fun. And then it'd be one thing if it was like one, one shot, one angle, and it's just them kind of fucking around or whatever. And then, you know, you cut back to Holloway who does his, huh, and then walk away. That'd have been fine. Instead, I think we get three or four shots of this, including one where the camera just goes a booty. Like it couldn't, it just, here's a full frame of she Hulk ass just twerking directly into the camera. And I'm just like, Oh no. <laughs> like, uh, this, okay. So this is got it. All right. Now, granted, Yes, I think that was kind of a dumb thing to have there. Uh, I don't think it was dumb for the reason that a lot of, not to go back into it, a lot of idiots online uh, online think it's dumb. Uh, if anything, it's more just there was a joke that worked there and they just drove it. They drove it 700 feet through the ground. Like it did not need to be that extended and it felt kind of weird and leery. In a way, like I, I felt there are there are people who are looking for reasons, who are who are actively trying to find reasons to dislike stuff about Marvel in general. And like whatever. Everyone's art is subjective, everyone's got their own opinions, that's fine. You know, I like I'm not gonna police other people's, you know, thoughts on these things. Uh those folks kind of made the argument of like, man, this is really embarrassing for Marvel. And it's like Marvel doesn't give a shit for one. And nor is it going to bother any of them at the end of the day. I thought it was kind of embarrassing for, um, uh, you know, Tatiana Maslany, the, the actor who plays she Hulk and Jennifer Walters, if only because it felt very, like male gazy, I don't know. It it wasn't like, oh, here's here's her standing and the camera's just like or anything like that, but I don't know. It it was just such a long set of shots and it didn't kind of have to do with anything and it was just kind of like this feels this feels strange. Something feels off. And like granted, maybe that was their idea while they were shooting was like, can we just do like this one extra scene just for the fucking hell of it? And if that's the case, like all the power to them. Um, I don't know. It felt kind of forced. It felt kind of weird and, um, a little embarrassing for her, I guess. Not for like, oh, everything is ruined or like, who cares? It's a dumb scene from a dumb episode of a dumb show. And it's mostly just dumb fun. Uh, but like, I don't know. It, it, it was just sort of like, a, oh boy, this one, this one just kind of, it just went on for too long. I thought it was, it was something that could have been done a little shorter and it would have made sense and it would have fi felt fine. Uh, she closes it off with like a, with like a, I, I think the other problem too is celebrity cameos are always kind of a, a hit or miss thing when it comes to media. Megan the Stallion feels out of place, both as a reference and as a, a an appearing and speaking character. Uh, and unfortunately, sometimes a lot of celebrity cameos, if they're not particularly good actors and they don't have to be actors, uh, they, like they don't have to be like Oscar. Can, like it's, it's more a matter of what makes for a good celebrity cameo is natural acting. I think a really good example would be, uh, Kevin Garnett in, uh, um, uncut gems. He shows up as a full character. He is actually like a main part of what's going on. He's not an actor. He's a basketball player. Uh, and but when he shows up, he was directed extremely well by what the sa uh, the uh, the Safety Brothers, uh, and he was directed in a way that felt very natural. It felt like you're looking at Kevin Garnett checking out a bunch of a bunch of like awesome like gemstones and, and jewelry and stuff like that. And it seemed like he was just being him as opposed to, I don't know the way that it was written and acted for Megan, the stallion felt very like forced and artificial. It she wasn't directed very well. I don't think for, for her, she didn't appear that much. She literally had, I think 
like two lines plus the kind of mildly improv twerking scene. Um, and I just don't, I, it just felt, I don't know. It felt, it felt out of place, I guess is what it really boils down to. Um, it was just kind of an awkward, an awkward dismount to an otherwise generally fine episode. I thought, I thought both of the court, uh, both of the legal proceedings that we got for this episode were fine. I thought they were very interesting and the strategy they used to win Dennis's case, I thought was kind of fun too. Uh, where, you know, her Jennifer takes the stand to say that like, yes, Dennis legitimately believes that he could pull Megan the stallion. He's not full of shit here. He legitimately was tricked and yeah, probably deserves his money back. Um, And yeah, I don't know. I thought most of the episode was fine, but there were a couple of those moments in there. I was just like, "Mm, that was a little bit off. Uh, And for that, I think I'm going to give this one a, I'm going to give it a five. I was debating a six. And if it wasn't for the like weird Megan Thee Stallion stuff, I would probably be more like a seven, uh, maybe even an eight. Um, But it just, it really was a, bad dismount to the episode if it just ended without a stinger uh this would have been yeah uh, probably like a seven uh at least and that would have been only because of the Megan the stallion stuff earlier in the episode too um so yeah i am gonna have to do my very best to not just make the thumbnail for this video a shot of them twerking in jennifer's corner office I'll do my best. We'll see. Uh, I would love to hear what you guys think of the episode within reason. <laughs> don't don't like, you know, blow everything up. But um, I would love to hear what you guys think of this review, too. Obviously, we're still kind of, you know, I'm still kind of getting my bearings about me when it comes to these more off the cuff ones. I've got notes, but, you know, it it's still it's not scripted. So uh, so sometimes I kind of go in different directions there. But I. Uh, we're gonna be we're gonna be picking up the pace for what's left of the show. We got six more episodes as well as Werewolf by Night, uh, which I'm very excited for. I've heard extremely positive things, um, and then we'll have uh, Wakanda Forever and the Guardians of the Galaxy Christmas special by uh, now DC creative uh, creative president, creative CEO. I forget what they made him exactly, but James Gunn is now heading up Warner Brothers uh, DC division stuff. So hopefully that means. Uh, an increase in quality on that side too within the DCU, DCEU. It's it's confusing over there. Hopefully they can right their ship. It's been it's been a little rough. Um, but thank you guys very much. Uh, I don't think I've got anything else to say here. Um, yeah, we'll have to see how we'll we'll see how it goes. I don't actually know what the next episode is, so uh, we'll see what we've got, and I'll catch you next time. Bye.